course it is. <laughs> okay, let's get... If I go preset 2, you should have me. And if I do... No PC is connected. That's interesting. Just do another function F8 or whatever it is and see what happens. There you go. Okay, I'm, I got a weird thing going on, but we'll. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Oh. You thought you saw my bubble there, I think. Actually, did I think it was. talking about visual filters, we were dealing with um, visual markup styles. I do want to, I'm having computer issues here, so hold on just a second, okay. Uh, I do want to talk uh, for a minute about some, a couple more markup styles, of, excuse me, that's not correct, a couple more visual filters uh, that you have. And I think these are particularly interesting, and that is because of what they do. Uh, if you go to your library, do Control L to open your library, and type in under all maybe Hebrew Bible. Yeah, and actually do it by title, that'll be better. And you need to find the Anderson Forbes. Analyzed text. It's the Hebrew Bible, Anderson Forbes Analyzed Text. And yes, open that Bible. Everybody should have it. If you have scholars or higher, you should have it. I'm going to make mine really big here for just a couple of minutes. I realize we don't spend a lot of time in this class doing Hebrew, uh, but if you scroll down, go ahead and type in Genesis 1 1 in the reference box at the top. And you'll see that it is a full-blown Hebrew Bible. It's backwards. It works from right to left instead of left to right. But with this Bible open, I want you to go up under View, and I want you to go to Visual Filters. And you should have two new ones that we haven't ever seen before. One of them is called uh, Color by Icefeld Source. And the other one is uh, insert Anderson Forbes genre tagging. So select color by Eisfeld source and add it to the active list. And then close that window. Just select one? Yeah, just the color by Eisfeld source. And you don't really see any change in Genesis 1.1, but start to scroll through your Genesis Bible. When you get to chapter 2, you're going to start to notice some interesting color changes. Who can tell me what this coloring is doing? Go ahead, Perry. You know. <laughs> I'm going to guess is that's how the documentary hypothesis people provide things up. This is the coloring for the doc hype. 
It's coloring the, the text into four, actually five different sources. Might be six. The uh, red lettering is the J source. The blue lettering is the E or Eloist source. The green lettering is D for Deuteronomist. The purple lettering is P for Priestly. The orange lettering is H for Holiness Code. And the L, uh, the navy colored stuff is L for Lay. Uh, and I'm not familiar with Lay. I haven't looked at the current uh, examples of the doc hype. The reason I show you this is twofold. Once, quite often, we have students who think nobody believes the doc hype. <laughs> well, here's proof that it is a mainstream teaching outside of the Lord's Church. I, I mean, you've got major Bible software that they have gone through the trouble of giving you all the color coding so that you know exactly where the J document is and where the E document begins and ends and that kind of stuff. The other thing that's really interesting is look at, like if you go to chapter 2, verse 17, you've got one word uh, that's in that verse that is said to be uh, part of the J document, and the rest of it is part of the, um, I think it's part of the lay document. Now, if you just hover over the document, you'll get a little pop-up window that's going to show you what the source is. And I, I realize this is silly, but... Here, right here, it'll say lay. If you hover over one of the colored documents, or colored words, it'll tell you that that's the uh, J document or the Eloist or the Yahwist, the poetry, whatever the case may be. So here, right in major mainstream Bible software, you have the teaching of, of the documentary hypothesis. People believe this, folks. This is not just some obscure teaching that we use to punish freshmen by making them write a paper on the documentary hypothesis. Uh, this is what is taught out in the world about the source of the Pentateuch. So I thought you might find that interesting. The other one is called, uh, the other visual filter is called insert Anderson Forbes genre tags. And if you add it and close, you get these... Um, markers uh, between each of the lines that show you what these different genres are. Uh, I'm not familiar with Anderson Forbes marking uh, because I'm not a Hebrew scholar in addition to not being a Greek scholar. Um, but you can mark up. Now these are the only places that these two filters show up is in this Anderson Forbes analyzed Hebrew Bible. So you're not going to see the color by Eisfeld anywhere else and you can't do anything to it you can't change the colors you can't modify the filter you can basically turn it on turn it off uh, and that's it so I wanted to show you what those visual filters were in case you ran across them we um, we left off what we're doing is we're trying to go through uh, piece by piece through these menus and we are actually on the view menu and we looked at visual filters and visual markup styles. Everything else in that particular menu, we have looked at at some point already before. The contents pane, the locator pane, uh, actually I find those much easier to launch from the individual windows rather than going up to the menu items. And you'll find that to be the case with a lot of these menu items. I'm just going through them so that you know where you can find them in addition to within the specific windows or at the home page. Uh, but most of these, there are other ways to launch these filters and things. Visual filters and visual markup. Uh, visual filters, we talked about, this is the only place you can launch those from. Visual markup, you actually have an icon pull down in the icon menu that will let you get access to how to write in your Bibles uh, and that kind of thing. But the rest of the view menu, I think, is pretty self-explanatory at this point. The contextual part of it at the bottom, whether you're looking at an interlinear or you're looking at a Bible text or you're looking at a commentary, we know that those things change. We've already talked about Zoom, so we're going to move on from there. Under the Go menu, uh, Go is basically a place to just execute commands and do launches. You'll notice the first one is My Library. 
And if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that in some of these menus, they give you the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, my library is Control L, and I really, really, really recommend that you learn these keyboard shortcuts. Uh, if, if you guys could just make sure everybody's got one of those. Um, I, what I'm handing out right now is a keyboard shortcut list that is available to you. It's also available on the um, class website, which is web dot mac dot com slash ministry tech and you'll notice that under the course info page uh, on this right hand side column I have a number of things I've changed the name of it to logos links and you'll find a number of things one is you'll see that there is a keyboard shortcuts uh, link hyperlink on there and it will take you to logos website where you can get this information but I thought it might be valuable for you to have it printed out where you can keep it around and notice some things. Learn at least two or three major ones. Control L is certainly one of them. The other thing that you have there uh, on the front is a Greek keyboard uh, layout. It's actually a PDF file that you can download from the Logos website. And we're going to talk about that probably later today. You can actually type in Greek. Uh, and I will show you how to do that. But you need to know what keys map to what keys. Uh, so the A is not necessarily the alpha, although it, it, it is. But there are some other ones. For example, the V on your keyboard is not a V. Uh, and so you, you just got to get used to how to type in Greek. Typically, I don't, it's very rare for me to need to type in a Greek word. If I'm going to do a Bible word search or some, a Bible word study, I usually launch it from the Greek text. And so I really don't, you know, I, about two, three years ago, I made a very concerted effort to learn this keyboard pattern. And I could type very well in Greek when I needed to type a word. Uh, the problem is it's just like anything else. You don't use it a lot. You forget it. And especially since when you're doing searches for Greek words, you're doing Bible word studies on Greek words, you have to get the breathings and the accent marks correct or it will not find it. Uh, so you have to work on those things and it just gets to be uh, a pain for me to remember where the rough breathing is and where, you know, where the different uh, accents are. So uh, I typically don't use it, but it is something that you need to have and you should be able to type in Greek, at least if you need to. So uh, understand that that's what's going on there. So the Go menu, basically you launch My Library, Control-L. Uh, the next two we're going to wait on, Topic Browser and Reference Browser. We're going to get to those later on today, but um, those are kind of search criterion. They're, they're tools that help you search. And so we're going to deal with that as we get into the searching uh, through Libronics. The next one on the list is History. History is very interesting. I almost always forget that it's there. Uh, it's another one of those things that I don't find a real need for that often. But basically, it's a history of where you've been. Uh, it's more detailed than just a back button in a browser because it will actually span multiple resources. If you jump from book to book to book, your back button won't work because it's only going to take you back to the last place you were in that particular book. But this is actually a map of places you've been uh, and how you could maybe get back to them if you wanted to. It's a, it's a visual uh, signal. For example, last night I did a search for baptism of the dead in, East, in Easton's Bible Dictionary. Now, I, it's been, I've gone to dozens of resources th since then, but if I need to get back to that article in Easton's, if I'm in the middle of a study and I say, you know, an hour ago, I looked at that report, and I don't remember what search I did to find it. I can pull up uh, my history here. I can click on it, and you'll notice that when I clicked on it, it opened Easton's Bible Dictionary to the Baptism for the Dead article. So it is a good tool. It's just one of those things that I forget about. <laughs> and when I'm doing protracted studies, I tend to use favorites and bookmarks on the things that are important to me, and we're going to talk about those today as well. 
so that I can get back to uh, particular articles or particular places within resources. But if you need it, it's there. How far back does the history go? Um, not real far. It's, it's typically the last session or so. But it's going to depend on your memory and of your computer and, and that kind of thing. So I don't I haven't seen a, a detail that says specifically how far back it. But it is like anything else. Once you reach a certain point, it starts dropping things off the, the back end to make room for everything that you have on the front end. So uh, it's not going to save you everywhere. But you'll notice I just launched this today. And it's got my history in it. It's not just from your current session. It does save that information. So if you launch the next day and forget where you were or, you know, how to get back to something, you can look at your history and kind of follow your, your steps and say, okay, this is where I was yesterday, and this is where I need to keep going today. So it's, it's a valuable tool. Uh, again, one of the problems, and I, I'm starting to say this a lot, and that's okay with me, um, this program has so much in it that you start to become this little creature of habit and I use these four tools all the time. And you start to forget about all of this other stuff that you can bring to bear on a passage uh, or in your study that will help you go deeper but I use these four tools. So I run my exegetical guide, I look at my Greek resources, I run my passage guide, I look at my commentary resources, uh, and then I run an exegetical guide, because <laughs> that's all you remember. So, uh, you know, be thinking outside the box, explore, play with the software from time to time, uh, you know, just spend some time having fun, and I don't know, maybe you guys aren't like me, but I, it's fun for me to play with some of these new tools and see what they do. I enjoy that. Uh, maybe I'm sick in that respect, but uh, I like research too. So you know that's that's part of the problem. Mike, yes. You may have already come to this last class, so this may not be a very good question. Um, but I went home the other night, just kind of practicing with the filters mm -hmm. and um, set up a study that I'm studying James. Uh huh. Well, last night when I get went to click back on it, all of my filters are gone. Is there a way I can save it with all of my no, if you um, if you turn the filters on, and if you closed the program properly, it didn't crash. Your computer didn't just shut off or something. When you go back, those filters should still be on. If they turn themselves off, there's something wrong somewhere. Um, so yeah, that is something that has happened in the past with some folks. Uh, and it is a bug somewhere. So you, if it continues to happen where your visual filters, every time you launch Libronics, you have to redo all your filters, something's wrong and call Logos Tech Support and say, my filters aren't sticking. How do I, how do I get them to stay there? Has anybody, you know, I've, you, I've had a few of you that have had unique problems and I've suggested you call Logos Tech Support. Has anybody done that in the last week or so and actually talked to them? No? Okay. Um, they really are nice folks. I, you know, I got to say, most tech support phone numbers that you call, I loathe. It's like pulling teeth to get them to help you, and they usually want to blame it on some other resource or somebody. It's not our problem. It must be some other software you're running that's causing the problem. I've just never had that problem from the Logos people. They, they're very nice folks. They want to help, and they're usually very good at, at resolving your issues. So. Don't hesitate to use that as a resource. I mean, don't struggle week after week with the same problem when you can make a call and probably fix it. Okay. The next one on the list is parallel resources. Where else can you get to that parallel resources information, Todd? Uh, Where else do you find that information? Yeah, the top of each individual window. You got a little icon that looks, I, th I still think it looks like two little batteries. <laughs> it's supposed to be two books, a red book and a blue book with a slash in between them. 
To me, it looks like two batteries, one that's red because it's running out of a charge and one that's blue because it's not. I don't know. Um, their, their icons don't help me a whole lot. But in the top of every window, you have this parallel resources link. And it actually makes so much more sense to, to check this from each individual window because your parallel resources are dependent on what kind of resource you're looking at, right? I mean, if I'm looking in my Bible window and I click on parallel resources, I'm going to get my Bibles. If I'm looking in a commentary and I look at parallel resources, I'm going to get my commentaries. So launching this from the, the Go menu at the top, what parallel resources is it going to give you? It's going to give you whatever window is active. Okay, now how on this screen can you tell which window is active? It's darker, isn't it? See how when you click on these title bars, the window gets darker that's active? That's what's telling you, okay, when I go to a menu item and run something, that's the window that's going to be affected. Okay? Typical window stuff, but... The problem with running it from the menu is you have to make sure you have clicked on the window that you want to see the parallel resources for. Well, why not? If you've got to click on the window, why not just click on the parallel resources icon in that window? Make sense? All right. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, the rest of this uh, menu is pretty self-explanatory. We've covered all of these as well, previous to next, um, back and forward. All of those we have looked at. And then Alt, Home, to go home. When you click on Home, it just launches your home page. So if you use the Alt, Home, keyboard shortcut, it brings you to your home page regardless of whether you're in a, a workspace or not. Now, if you do Control, Alt, Home, it closes all the windows in your workspace and opens the home page. It's called Close All and Open Home. So you got to ask yourself, what do you want to do? Sometimes you want to just get to the home page uh, to do something really quick. Well, go ahead and just hit Alt Home to get there, or go under the Go menu and select Home. You also have the icon, the first icon in your icon bar should be Home, and does the exact same thing. You just click on that icon. All it does is open the home page. Questions about that? The Go menu is pretty straightforward. There are The two things that I want you to remember, because we're going to come back to them very soon, is the topic browser and the reference browser. Those are going to be important tools. And control T for topic, topic browser. Control R for reference, reference browser, uh, will come in handy. And we're going to deal with these today, but we're just not going to do it right this second. I'm going to close my home page. Now... How many of you use the internet? Goodness. Just about fell out of my chair. Nobody uses the internet. Just three of you is all? During class, right? Only during class. Um, one of the things that we are very used to is favorites, right? Saving bookmarks. Now, logos started out with just something that they called bookmarks. And they didn't mean it like bookmarking like we bookmark web pages, at least not exactly. They thought of it more like the ribbons that you put in your Bible or a paper bookmark that you put in a resource. You have a limited number of bookmarks. If you go up under your favorites menu, you'll notice that if you hover over where it says bookmarks, you have nine, and that's it. Now, they're grayed out because you haven't set any of them yet. You follow? Um, click on your Bible. Make sure you have a workspace open with your Bible and probably a commentary window. But go to James 1.1. And now go up under your favorites menu and go to bookmarks and click on set bookmark and just select the very first one. Now when you go to your bookmarks, you'll notice that your first bookmark is James 1.1. And it'll stay there until you delete it or clear it or change it to something else.
These are just like the ribbons you put in your Bible. Once you set it on James 1.1, 1, 1, it stays in your Bible until you pull it out and put it on some other page. Okay? So just think of this as having nine ribbons. Now, the nice part is that you've got nine ribbons that you can put anywhere. I mean, it's not just in your Bible. I can put one ribbon in my New American Standard Bible. I can put one ribbon in Art and Gingrich. I can put one ribbon in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It doesn't matter where you put them. But you only have nine. Now, the advantage of these is that you can see you have keyboard shortcuts. So you can then go Control-1 is going to automatically jump to James 1.1. 1, 1. So if there are places while you're doing a study uh, that you keep going back to, uh, you're doing an extended study on Agapao, and it's a 27-page uh, report in TDNT, and it's a page and a half in Art and Gingrich, and you don't want to have to keep searching for it. Well, you just bookmark them, and then when you need to get back to that page, you do control two, control three, whatever, and you jump right back into those resources. Uh, so it's, it's a very handy way uh, to get to some very important things that you're studying. It's not particularly useful, in my opinion, for long-term bookmarking. Because what you're after, if you only have nine, what you're studying changes over time. So do I really need to be able to do, to do control four for the next five years to get to a word study on Agapao in TDNT? Probably not. Once I've done that study, it's time to move on. You know, I've, I'm on to a different topic. There's something else that I'm studying. So you don't really need it for long-term uh, bookmarking. So what they did was they actually added favorites. And favorites are just like bookmarks in your web browser. They're exactly like bookmarks in your web browser. When you are in a resource, for example, now, if I click on my New American Standard Bible, I'm at James 1.1. 1, 1. If I go up under favorites and say add to favorites, the title of it, I can change the title of it if I want to. But once I say OK, I now have a permanent bookmark to James 1.1, 1, 1, and you'll notice that it's listed in the bottom here. You can organize your bookmarks by creating folders, and I'll, I'll show you that. You'll notice on my screen, and I realize it's hard to see, but on my screen I have two bookmarks, two favorites. See, I, I'm just in the habit of using the term bookmarks. I have two favorites. One is to a word study on elders in BDAG, in Art and Gingrich, the other is a word study on Elder in Little Kittle. If I click on the BDEG one, you'll notice it launches Art and Gingrich right to that page in uh, Art and Gingrich, uh, to this word study on Presbyteros. So I'm right where I need to be. If I want to look at my bookmark on Little Kittle, I can do the exact same thing. Okay. This works just like you're familiar with. It's not a problem. If I go up under favorites and I want to organize these, I click on organize favorites. I can add a new folder, and I'm going to just call it elder study. And then I'm going to drag these two word studies, book of favorites, into that folder. And when I close this and go up under my favorites menu, I now have a folder in my favorites that leads me to those. So this isn't, this shouldn't be rocket science for anybody that's working on the internet much. But it's very cool that it's in this software because you will find uh, if you're setting up Bible studies, let's say that you have a Bible study chain that you do, well, you could link to all of those different resources, all of those references, put them as favorites, and you could jump to them one after another. Do you ever write in your Bible that way? Do you ever create a chain reference in your Bible where you start a study and on the very first verse, at the end of that verse, you write where the next verse is that you want to jump to? Well, you could do that with favorites. You could create a little personal Bible study, create a folder in your favorites folder, and um, put all of those references in there, and then you could jump from one to another. I don't think it's odd anymore to consider that you would come to somebody's house to do a Bible study and sit down and pop open your laptop. Um, you know, it's 
It is God's Word. It's just in a different form, right? I mean, the paper and the leather isn't holy. It's the words that are holy. And as long as we're looking at something that has the same words, we're, we're good to go. So, you know, when you think about the power of being able to show them a DVD that's a Bible study or something, starting to take your laptop to this kind of stuff isn't, shouldn't be that unusual. So uh, consider using this tool to do that kind of stuff. Questions about bookmarks or favorites? Pretty straightforward stuff. I don't think this is rocket science for anybody. Now, one of the things within the favorites uh, menu that I want to show you, that's in, it, it's important, but unfortunately, it's not going to work for some of you. You'll notice that you have a copy location to clipboard. How many of you are using Microsoft Word 2003? Okay, how many of you are using 2007? Okay. No, that's, XP is the operating system. Word 2007 is what I meant to say. What did I say? Yeah, oh, okay. Well, then yours is still work. Yours is the equivalent of 2003. For 2007 users, if you bought the new Microsoft Office, and I know a number of you have it, this trick does not work yet, and I can't figure out how to get it to work. Um, but it's a really cool trick. <laughs> and, and so I do want to show it just because it, it does become important. I can get it to do what it's supposed to do in Office. I have 2007 on this machine, too. It does the right things. It just doesn't work once I do all the right things. That, I, it's a long way to say um, I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> Let me go ahead. I'm going to get Word uh, open here real quick. Uh, yeah, if you if you have um, if you have any version of Microsoft Word, go ahead and launch it. I want to show you how to do this because my guess is that they're going to have a fix for 2007 sometime soon, and you need to know what the steps are in order to do it. And just open a blank Word document. We're going to look at some cut and pasting options, too. Uh, so you're going to need Microsoft Word open uh, anyhow. Now, I'm taking notes, or I'm writing a sermon outline, and um, I'm talking about elders. Since I already have bookmarks for those, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, and you might just want to... Um, watch initially. Well, no, let's let's find one that you guys can all do. Go back to Logos and open your control L to open your library and open your Bible knowledge commentary. I keep using this not because I think it's such a great commentary, but it's one that I know that you all have. At least you're supposed to all have it. So don't think I'm a big Bible knowledge commentary fan. It's just one that we end up getting to a lot because everybody should own it. Now, since I was at James 1.1, it went to James 1.1. So go ahead. If you're not with me, go to James 1.1. And you'll notice that this is uh, starting chapter 1, verse 1, and it's the salutation and greeting and, and that kind of thing. Do you want us to link it? No, you don't have to link it to anything. But I do want you to go up, now that you're at James 1.1 in your Bible Knowledge Commentary, I want you to go up under your Favorites menu, and I want you to select Copy Location to Clipboard. If you do not have this, then you still have not in, uh, installed the Power Tools add-in that I asked you to install two and a half weeks ago. Uh, so you'll just have to follow on, along on screen, but everybody should have it. It is part of the Power Tools add-in. So click on that once. Nothing appears to happen, but... What you just did is you copied a resource location to your clipboard. Now go to your Microsoft Word document. And I'm going to just say insert, and it should be under your insert menu, and you should be able to insert a hyperlink. Now, yours is, your version is different than mine, but you should have a command somewhere in your insert menu to insert a hyperlink. 
when you do, it, it, both, com both programs have a similar looking uh, dialog box. It should say at the top, text to display. And I'm going to just type in James 1.1 in Bible Knowledge Commentary. And then down where it says address, click your cursor, and then use your keyboard shortcut for paste. It should be control V. And you should get this really cryptic looking gobbledygook in here, programmer looking stuff. Does everybody get that? Click on addresses. You just click on insert. Put your cursor in that box where it says address, and then do a paste, control V. And it should paste this strange looking text in there, and then say OK. What you'll notice is that the text in your Word document now has become a blue hyperlink. And if you hover over it, and this even works in 2007, it says control click to follow the link. So if you hold down the control button and click, it should take you to Libronix and open your Bible Knowledge Commentary to that link. Now, with Word 2007, it doesn't. It says make a selection, and it doesn't go any further than this. It's created correctly, but it doesn't go to Libronix for some reason. Now, just to prove to yourself that it's working, for those of you that don't have Word 2007, go back and close the Bible Knowledge Commentary. In 2007? Yeah. Good. I don't know why mine's not working, but it's not. Uh, go back to lo Logos. Have you updated uh, recently? I, I just have to say, I'm sorry. You, you just keep losing points, you know? Every day I get to write a little minus five points next to Brett's name, and I enjoy that. So There's a little chip in your head that is supposed to control your tongue. Read the book of James that talks about controlling your tongue, and you should, you should learn. Uh, go ahead and close your, your Bible knowledge commentary. You don't have to close anything else. Just click that window closed, and now go back to your Word document and do it again. And do the control click, and you'll, you'll see that it will launch your Bible knowledge commentary to the page that you want. Now, how cool is this, folks? You're taking notes in class. And since you are diligent students, and I know that you all are, in the evening you're reviewing your notes, as you should be, from John class today. And he's talking about a particular word study. So you launch Art and Gingrich to confirm that it really does mean what the instructor said that it means. And you want to bury that link into your notes. So you select that note in your uh, Word document, and you say, turn it into a hyperlink. You paste that resource tag in there, and forevermore, when you launch that Word document and click control click on that note, it's going to open Art and Gingrich. Even if you don't have Logos running, if you control click on that word, it will launch Logos. It will open that book to that page. Very, very cool. And this is a way you want to add depth into your notes for your classes, into your sermon outlines and that kind of stuff. Not that you're going to preach from a computer screen, but just so that you have that background in those notes, you can bury all kinds of links in your Word documents. Can you do the same thing on uh, like PowerPoint presentation? Where you can, yes. You know, I'm going through PowerPoint and I can link it to it. And I yes. can show them the resources and go back to the PowerPoint. Yes. Any place that you can create a hyperlink, you can do this because you're linking to this resource. So PowerPoint should work. Microsoft Word should work. And it's, I'm, it's great that you guys are getting it to work. I don't know why it's not doing it on my 2007. Uh, so I, I need to play with that and figure it out. What did you lose another five points for? <laughs> well, I think Larry actually has something. Yeah, I think it was Larry that lost the points on that one. <laughs> um, but, but start to think of the possibilities of this. You, you start to really say that, okay, my notes are my notes, but do I really need to copy down this three-line 
definition of this particular Greek word from Martin Gingrich, or uh, imagine being able to hyperlink all of your your Bible references in your class notes to your electronic Bible. Uh, that starts to become powerful. Now, one of the things that I have not, I'm not going to demonstrate in here because, again, it does not work. This one I know doesn't work yet in 2007, um, in Word 2007, is there is a thing called a smart tag. Smart tags in Microsoft Word are ways to embed information in Microsoft Word. And if you go to the Logos website, and actually if you go to this class's website, you'll find a link to it. On the blog, I talk about this particular feature. There's a little program called a smart tag that you can download and install in Microsoft Word. And what will happen is every time you type a reference, like if I'm just in Microsoft Word here and I type James 1, 1, I'll get a little underline that tells me that it recognizes that information. And I'll get a little box next to the word. And I can actually click on that and tell it to hyperlink to my logos that way or actually paste in James 1.1 from my preferred Bible into my Word document. I don't have to type it all in. I just say replace reference with text and it'll go to logos, it'll copy James 1.1 and it'll paste it into my Word document. So again, that becomes very powerful from a time-saving standpoint because you don't have to type long passages. Uh, in almost all of my early notes in my classes, I went back afterwards and where they gave me a list of references, I changed them all to individual lines and I pasted in the text from those references from all over scripture. Well, it took me minutes because I didn't have to type it all out. I could just say, insert the text. Did you say that doesn't work in <coughs> I, from what I've read, it, it does, they don't have a current smart tag for 2007. Great. Okay. I think they might have fixed it. I know they're working on all of these. And my environment is a little different. I'm actually running Windows on a Mac, and so I haven't, I haven't troubleshooted some of this stuff. Um, <coughs> so the smart tag is important. Go download the smart tag and install it in Microsoft Word. It will save you tons of time. When I do sermon outlines, you know, I've got references that I want to mention. Well, I just se select it and say paste it in, and it, it automatically pastes the text in for me. I don't have to type the whole thing in. Very powerful, okay? Uh, so it's a way to create these bridges between programs like Microsoft Word and uh, PowerPoint and your Logo software, which is really what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, it, Logos is wonderful, and it's powerful, and it... It stands on its own, but it's nice to be able to integrate some of these features with your Word documents and with your PowerPoint file. I am a firm believer in PowerPoint. We're going to talk about PowerPoint later on in this quarter. And one of the things that frustrates me is when preachers just put a string of references on the screen. Folks, you got to recognize you may know each one of those by heart. 90% of your congregation looks at that and goes, huh? I don't know what any of those say. And we throw them around like, well, you know, of course, it's, you know, in John 5, 6, it, you know, that applies. It does? I don't even know what John 5, 6 says, let alone how it applies. So help your members. Put the text on the screen in your PowerPoints. <coughs> and one of the ways that you can do that is by uh, copying and pasting and using smart tags and those kinds of things. So that will be beneficial. So we've got the favorites menu. We've got copy location to clipboard. We also have a way to organize those bookmarks and to keep things uh, in there for long-term study. Uh, if you have gone through the trouble of studying through elders and where all the word studies for that are, uh, you may as well put them in your favorites so that you can get to them again and you don't have to do the searches all over again and you don't have to reconstruct those studies from scratch. Any question about the favorites menu or uh, bookmarking, that kind of stuff? It's pretty straightforward, right? Hello? Okay. All right. Tools. 
this is really the last major menu we have to get through before we're going to get into some searching and that kind of stuff. But there is a lot in here. And don't forget this tools menu because it becomes valuable. First you have Libronics Update and everyone should know where Libronics Update is and everybody should be running it probably once a month or so. Get in the habit of checking this out because it's what keeps your tools up to date. Now, they're not going to give you a bunch of free stuff and that kind of stuff. There's not tons of free books every time you, you launch it. But what happens is people report bugs and people report typos and resources and that kind of stuff. And so they make those changes and update your, your resources. So you want to make sure that you're keeping up with system updates, with resource updates and that kind of stuff. And you do all that through the Libronics update. Account management. Account management is simply where you go to manage the details of your account. Who you are, where you live, how they can get in touch with you, what your customer ID is, and that kind of stuff. So you can update your information if you move by just clicking, no, this is not correct, and typing in new things uh, and going from there. The next one is Unlock Resources. This is a place where you can buy resources online that are downloadable. Uh, you select it. You select a book, say that you want to buy it. It looks up the price, asks for a credit card, does all that kind of stuff. So uh, I don't think we need to go through that. Now, before we get to define collections, we have to have a conversation. Todd, how are books in the library organized? In any library. According to the alphabet. Okay, according to the alphabet. So on shelf 1 1, it starts with A and it goes all the way through Z. Is that the way libraries are organized? Roger, how are libraries organized? Category. They're alphabetical within a category. You follow? So, you have a preacher's library. I assume many of you are beginning a preacher's library. You, you now have a huge one in your computer, but some of you are starting print libraries as well. How are you going to organize your books on your shelf? Miles, what are you going to do? You got three Greek grammar books. Are you going to spread them out all over the place? No. <laughs> That's a... That was an excellent guess. <laughs> we tend to organize them by category, right? If I'm going to put all of my Christian evidence books together. I'm going to be, put all of my Greek language books together. I'm going to put all of my commentaries together. I'm going to put my Bible dictionaries together and so on. It just makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you don't want to start at the first book on your shelf and try to find things on 15 shelves were the books. Well, the same thing happens electronically. You have to begin to think about this concept of, I want to organize my books into collections so that when I want to search my Bible dictionaries, I'm not searching all unlocked resources, right? I just want to search my Bible dictionaries. I know that my information is not going to be in a marriage counseling book. So why go there, right? I mean, why ask the computer to search through all those extra books when all you really want is to look at your Bible dictionaries? Does that make sense? Okay. I want you to go to Tools, Define Collections. Yours will most likely be empty. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we aren't on the right camera. And I am going to make a change here because we have a couple of classes where that is the case. There we go. Okay. I know you guys don't want to have to look at me back there, but that's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> I want you to select new under collection. And what do you see? What does this look like? Library. It looks like the My Library 
box, doesn't it? It looks like that same dialogue. Author, title, subject, all. Unlocked resources only. And you want to create collections primarily of your unlocked resources, not uh, all resources. But under title, select title, and type in dictionary. And actually type in, for the sake of doing this, type in Bible dictionary. Now again, you may have some that I don't have. I may have some that you don't have. But if you have Easton's, go ahead and add it to the window over. Harper's, add it to the window. The new Bible dictionary, add. I mean, just go ahead and add all of these Bible dictionaries into this collection. Because if you search for Bible dictionary, that's, that's all you're going to get in here. Now again, I may have some that you don't have. Don't let that bother you. Do you have two or three at least? Three or four? Everybody's got three, four, five, somewhere like that. Okay, the name of the collection in the upper right-hand corner, name it Bible Dictionaries. And then say, okay. I've just said you four dictionaries, right? I don't know how many you have. It doesn't matter. Just add them all and put them in a group called Bible Dictionary. Your mileage may vary. You may have Those five different. Two are the same. Yeah, if you just add them all over, it will it'll won't duplicate them. Now, in your defined collections box under collections, you should have Bible dictionaries, right? Yeah. Cool. So now you have a way to start to organize this massive library that you, that you own. You can start to group these books into collections. And just think of it as sectioning off your bookshelves. I'm going to put all of my Christian evidences stuff together. I'm going to put all my Greek grammar stuff together and so on. Now, why does this matter? Well, let me show you. If you go to... Back, just go ahead and close the defined collections. And we were in James 1.1 1, 1 in, in the Bible. Go up under Tools, Bible Study, and do a passage guide. And let it run on James 1.1. 1, 1. It should be pretty quick if you've got most of your categories closed, like I suggest you do anyway. Now, nothing special has happened, but I want you to go under Properties in your Passage Guide. And when you scroll down, about halfway down the list, actually probably two-thirds of the way down the list, you have a section of your Passage Guide called Collections. And you can actually select Bible dictionaries now as one of your collections. And when you say OK, you'll notice that now you have a whole section in your passage guide that is just from your Bible dictionaries. Now, I'm studying James 1.1. 1, 1. Look at all the things that it found in my Bible dictionaries that are relevant to James 1.1. 1, 1. I've got an article about the dispersion. I've got information about uh, dispersion in Easton's. And if I click on that, it opens up Easton's Bible Dictionary to dispersion. Its Greek word is diaspora, scattered, James 1, 1, 1 Peter 1, 1. Of the G and I could start to study through what that means. Can we go back a little bit? Mm -hmm. Passage Guide. Okay. Once you get to Passage Guide, hit Properties at the top of your Passage Guide. And when you look through all of these things that you can include in your passage guide, when you go about two-thirds of the way down, you have a box that's called Collections. And you should now have that Bible Dictionary's collection showing up in that window. And if you click the little checkbox right next to it and then say OK, it's going to rerun the passage guide. And now you'll notice that in your passage guide, you have a section called Bible Dictionary. <laughs> Mike, did you have a question? Well, I did, but not yet. Okay. <laughs> Do you have it? You see how that's working? 
Mr. Hobson? I have selected the Bible Dictionary and I clicked OK, but I think you can see it. Is that the top? You've got to scroll down for the top. The Bible Dictionary is underneath the top of the page. Yeah, it's going to be... It's going to be after music. It's going to be at the bottom of the report. The Bible Dictionary is underneath the top of the page, too. It's after music. So what you can now do is you can choose to include certain collections in your passage guides as you create them. Now, if I'm studying James 1.1 from my English dictionary or my English text, I'm probably not going to include a Greek grammars collection in my passage guide, but it could. I mean, you, you, you notice on mine, I have a number of collections created already. Uh, I've got early church fathers. I've got anti-Nicene fathers. I've got apologetics. I've got Greek grammars. I've got manners and customs. I've got Nicene and post-Nicene fathers. I've got Oxford's Dictionary and Theology. So there are a number of collections that I could search through. Now, all of that makes my passage guide much longer as far as what it's giving me information-wise. But I can focus it on just specific things. Now, I haven't shown you how to create the Early Church Fathers collections yet, but you'll notice in my passage guide on screen that when I searched for James 1.1, I not only got Bible dictionaries, I got Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. Now, what this is going to tell me is that and it's going to take a while to generate. It didn't find a, a, any references to James 1.1 in the Nicene or post-Nicene Fathers. So, while it's part of this list, it's not always going to find something, but at least you know. Okay? Does, does the concept of making a collection make sense at this point? All right. Let's go back. I'm going to close my passage guide. Go back to Tools, Define Collections. How many of you have the Silver Edition uh, of Logos or higher? Okay, so most of you have the Early Church Fathers. So I'm going to show you how you can now utilize the Early Church Fathers. The Early Church, what is the Early Church Fathers, Manny? Huh? What, what is this set of the early church fathers? I just didn't hear you. Say it louder. Yeah, the, the early church fathers is the whole set. So it's anti-Nicene, Nicene, and post-Nicene fathers. What is that? Go ahead. You're right. Just say it. Okay, what is the set of the early church fathers, Todd? Okay, I'm going back and changing L and R grades just this afternoon. JR. That's true. What are those? I can go back and change your grade too, even though it was like a year ago. It was written like um, before, uh, like 145. It's the writings of the early church fathers, correct? Anti-Nicene fathers is what, Terry? Before 325 A.D. Nicene and post-Nicene fathers is what? After 325 A.D. So it's this collection of writing from the early church. It's a really very important set of, of material that you guys spent weeks pouring through in L&R class just a couple of weeks ago and don't remember what they are. Um, so, I understand what you're looking at here. Go ahead and create a new collection. Now, the problem with the early church fathers, the way Libronic sends them to you, is just like print books. You've got each individual volume is a separate electronic book, just like upstairs. But how do you search the anti-Nicene fathers upstairs? Larry, do you remember? Uh, I think you used the index. Right? right. There was an index volume that was the key to all of the earlier volumes, right, for the, for the anti-Nicene. For the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers, there's an index in the back of each individual book. But you have to actually take that index volume off and look through it to find it. Well, guess what? 
Who remembers what the number of the, the uh, index volume was? Okay, so when you say new, click title, type in ante, A-N-T-E, and it will filter everything else out except for diagrammatical analysis. I'll show you why in just a second. And find volume nine. Volume nine isn't there. Why is volume nine not there? Because it's an index volume. And you should have, in theory, you have all the tools to search these books built into the software. They don't need the index volume. Now, I am going to tell you right now, if you can find an index volume for the early church fathers, anti-Nicene fathers, at a used bookstore, buy it and put it on your shelf. Sometimes it is far more detailed in its analysis of the early church fathers than you can search for topically. And we're going to talk about topic searches and reference searches and all kinds of different ways to search. But that index volume in print is, is a valuable book to have on your shelf. Okay? Now, if you're not in your office, you can still search the, the fathers, but I'll show you how. Click on the very first book, volume one, and just click add. And just keep clicking add, and you'll notice that it goes all the way down the list. You don't have to keep going back and forth and selecting. Just click add, and it adds the next one. Now, don't add diagrammatical analysis. I don't want that as part of your collection. Don't add, which it won't allow them, even though it's added. It won't allow us to add it. Sure it will. Sure it will. There's no reason it won't. It'll put any books together in a collection you want to put together. There may not be any reason to put them together, but it, it'll let you. Now, why is this book, Diagrammatical Analysis, in this list? Because the author's name has A-N-T-E in it. Now, I want you to understand that. When you typed in ANTI, you're just saying, show me any book that has the t in the title somewhere or in the author's name is what it's picking up, um, the letters A-N-T-E. It's not that the book starts with A-N-T-E. It's just that it's anywhere in there. If I typed in my last name, H-I-T-E, what else would I get? What author's name? This Lee L. Canton Wen or whatever is it? Canton Win. Do you see where the... I'm on title and I typed in Auntie and I have you guys have, so I don't know what, what uh, you're referring to. Right here. Do you see it on my screen? The very last one? Oh, it's Bob. Okay. My bad. Let's do it. My bad. <laughs> Lose five more points. <laughs> um, but, but I want you to understand here what, what's happening. It's looking for that string of letters. If I type in my last name, which is H I T E, in the author's name, what other authors might I get? So White, John White wrote a bunch of books. Well, they're going to show up in that list too, okay? So it looks weird that this book on diagrammatical analysis shows up in this list, but not really when you understand what's going on. So you've added all the anti-Nicene fathers. Name the collection anti-Nicene fathers or anti-Nicene or however you want to specify it. But make sure that it's anti. So we have only selected nine? Yes. I don't know what those Robert Now, um, don't worry about it. Just add them. Amanda, what does anti mean? Before. So these are the books before 325. Very good. Thank you for saving the day and actually... Remembering something from L&R. Um, why do I want these in a separate collection? Miles? <laughs> Perry, why do I want the anti-Nicenes in a separate collection? Um, I would put them there just so I could get to them quickly. Okay. And again, what, what is the anti-Nicene fathers? They're separate too. Their writings before 325 A.D. The early church fathers, 325 is pivotal. If you don't understand that, 
cut off, then you're, you're missing the whole point of the collection. It's based on 325 A.D. What happened in 325 A.D.? Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea. So this is all writings before 325. The other set that we'll create is after 325. So as I get closer to the first century, I'm looking at, at information that may be somewhat more accurate as far as doctrine goes. Uh, it's, it's certainly closer to the apostolic age, which is really what I want, right? When I'm looking at ancient stuff, the closer I can get to apostolic times, the better off I am. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't be wrong, and it doesn't mean that they're inspired. It just means that it's closer to that apostolic period, which makes it more valuable. So I want to, there's going to be times where I'm going to want to search just the anti nicenes I want to find information as close to the first century as I can. So... After you name it, go ahead and say OK. And you should now have a collection called the anti nicene Fathers. Now, click New. Go back to a new collection and type Nicene. N-I-C-E-N-E. -E. We're, we're finding resources under title, yes. And just start adding, and just click Add until it scrolls all the way through the list. There's not a di diagrammatical analysis here that you need to worry about. So it'll scroll all the way through. Now, there are multiple books listed here that are the same book. As we've talked about with my library before, they list these books differently for different kinds of searches, but it will not add the same book multiple times to your, your collection. It's only going to add the book once. You're not going to add volume one 15 times, okay? We're just doing the Nicene, not the anti-Nicene. Right. That's why we just type Nicene. And we also want the second series? You want everything that's in that list. Just click add and go all the way through it. Okay. So that's including what we just included in that other list. No. Because that's I, I typed in Nicene, mine are included. There. I don't know why. Yours are showing the, the anti-Nicene as well? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, s start, don't, inc well, go ahead, let's go ahead and do that. Because we want a collection of all the early church fathers. So include all of them, only be sure to name the collection early church fathers. Okay, we were going to do this collection anyway, so that's fine. So it should have the anti-Nicene fathers, and it should have all the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers and call it Early Church Fathers and say OK. When you have that one, go to New. And type in Nicene again. And then type in post. No, that doesn't work. Only instead of starting with the anti-Nicene, scroll down until you're to that first volume after anti-Nicene Fathers. Click on that one and click add. And just keep clicking add until it cycles through to the bottom of that list. I think Nicene and post works. Okay, that might. Type Nicene and post. Yeah, if you type Nicene and post, you'll filter out those anti-Nicenes, and then all you have to do is type, add, click the Add button to add all of them into the collection. And call this Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. What you've just done, and go ahead and say OK, and you should have, in your collections now, you should have an anti-Nicene Fathers, you should have a Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers, and you should have an early church Fathers. What you've just done is you've created collections that now give you more flexibility when you want to do a search. I only want to look at the early church Fathers before 325, so that's what I want to search. Or I only want to search after 325. 
Or I want to search the whole early church father's collection. And now you have that choice. Okay? Go ahead and close this. Go back to your Bible. Just make your Bible window active and go up under Tools, Bible Study. And launch a passage guide. Launch a passage guide on James 1.1. Before you launch it, though, click on Properties. Or if you already launched it, it doesn't matter. You can still click on Properties. Go under Collections and select Anti-Nicene Fathers Only. And say OK. And then run the passage guide. Yeah, just the anti-Nicene Fathers. Now you'll notice that you have a, a column heading in your passage guide that's marked anti-Nicene Fathers. In this case, it's got none. It did not find any references to James 1.1 and the anti-Nicene Fathers. Uh, but it's now part of your passage guide. So whenever you run things, it will find it if it's there. Did you find something, Brett? Oh, yeah. I got tons of stuff listed here. Mine's James 1.1 Right, I just changed mine to James 1.1. 1, 1. If you leave it at the first pericope, you'll find a ton of stuff. But you now have that collection of books. So now what's happening is every time you run your passage guide, you're telling it, in addition to the commentaries and biblical people and literary typing and all the other things that the passage guide does, I want you to look in the early church fathers, anti nicene fathers, and see if you find anything as well. Because that's important stuff to me. Or... I just want you to check my Bible dictionaries. Or I want you to check your anti-Nicene fathers and my Bible dictionaries. You follow? But you're starting to search for specific types of books rather than just saying, show me a link in every single one of my electronic books to James 1.1. Well, first of all, it takes forever for that report to run, and you end up with this giant list, and, and it, it becomes unmanageable. Is it just for that one passage, James 1.1? 1, 1, it's all it's looking for is James 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. Now, if you put James 1.1 1, 1 to 1.27, it's going to find things as long as it's in that passage range. It may find something on James 1, verse 20. It may find something on James 1, verse 5. And it's going to include all of that. Now, how many of you have ever done a Google search for a really broad term, uh, you search for God, you get 8,476,243 hits, right? What good is that? <laughs> it really doesn't help you, does it? Because it becomes so large that you can't manage it. Well, that's essentially what we're trying to do here with collections. As your electronic library gets bigger and bigger, do I really want to search my biblical counseling book for information on James 1.1 1, 1, and my apologetics book on James 1.1 1, 1, and my Christian evidences book on James 1.1 1, 1, and, you know, a, a book that I have on uh, sermon delivery on James 1? No. I, I mean, there, most likely there's not any hits in those books anyway, so why do I want to take the time to, to look through those. I want Bible dictionaries, or I want my anti-Nicene fathers. I want to see if the, if the early church fathers before 325 commented on James 1.1. 1, 1. If they did, I want to know about it. If they didn't, I don't care. It's just going to say none. Do you follow this mindset? You're starting to use your electronic library effectively now. We are beyond autopilot. We're now saying... This is a group of books that's important to me. They're valuable to the information that I use, and I want them searched automatically. The other thing that it's going to do is as we get into searching, you are now going to have collections that you can search for specific things. And we're going to talk about some of that today as well. I want you to go back. Go ahead and close the passage guide. I just want to show you where that appears because it's important. Why did show up in the passage guide? It is when you um, when you, you an exegetical guide. No, not exegetical under, guide. Yeah, the passage guide. It says that he has none. Under collections, it's not showing any collections. It, it will show 
Right. It, yeah, it'll say none because it didn't find any hits, but it's still looking through that collection. Click, click on your your properties. Uh, uh, and scroll down. Yeah, see, it's searching into 19 fathers. Go ahead and close that. I want to make sure that that's all that's happening. Right? When, when you scroll down, when you get the NC-19 fathers, it's just going to say none. That's just telling you that it found no hits in the NC-19 fathers for James 1.1. 1, 1. So it executed the search correctly. It's just saying that there were no results. Now, if you change that to a broader pericope, like James 1, 1 to 27, you're going to get, Brett, you did it. I mean, it's huge. You're going to get tons of hits. Yeah. Right. So every time you run a passage, God, no matter what passage you're on, if you still have Bible dictionaries, it won't pull up a commentary until you change it back to commentary. Yeah, in your commentary section of your passage guide, if you look at your properties for your passage guide again, you have a, a group that says collection under commentaries, and it by default should be under all unlocked commentaries is what it was by default. But now, if you click on that, you're going to see Anti-Nicene Fathers. Any place in the software now where it asks you for a collection, you have new collections that you can choose. It used to be all you had was all locked resources, all unlocked resources, or all known resources. Now you're going to start to have these collections showing up in all of those dialog boxes. And that's going to be important. That's going to be good because you don't want to search every book. Here's the way I, I'm a visual guy. Here's the way I think of this. I'm interested in what my Bible dictionaries have to say about baptism. So I go to my office, and I start in my bookshelf, and I start with the first book on the top shelf, and I pull it out, and I look to see if it says anything about baptism, and I put it back, and I grab the second book, and I, and I keep doing that until I find a Bible dictionary, and I pull it, oh, this is what I was looking for. Would you do that? You're going to scan through until you find your dictionaries, and that's all you're going to deal with. Well, that's what we just did, is we created a collection so that we can say, I don't care about the rest of my library. I don't care about all these other books, these thousands of books that I have in my stacks. All I want are these, and I want to look and search these. Now, the possibilities are infinite as far as how many collections you can create. Well, they're not infinite, but... You can create as many collections as you want, and just because a book is a part of one collection does not mean that it can't be part of another. Uh, you know, your one Bible dictionary, if you have Easton's, you can put Easton's in 15 different collections. doesn't matter to them. So it's a way of organizing yourself so that you can start to look at very specific things. Okay? Does it make, are we starting to get the concept? When we get to searching, it's going to make much more sense. And, and so I, I need you to kind of understand this concept of, of making collections. Okay. Since we are talking about collections, I want to start the conversation on searching. But I want to just go back to the goal menu. Go back to the goal menu and select reference browser. Or you can do control R. What is a reference? Where they got something. Okay. Most typically when we're dealing with the Bible, give me a reference to the Bible. James 1 1, right? Okay. So so long as we understand what a reference browser is looking at, it makes good sense. When you look at this little window, the first thing it says is in. Well, click on that. What do you see? Collections. Okay, it doesn't say collections, but that's what it is. So I want you to select anti-Nicene Fathers. The next one is type. And I want you to scroll down to Bible. Now, what is what is this that we're looking at? 
Data types. Thank you. Good job. Now, in find, I want you to type in Acts 2.38. And then look at the next choice down is match. You have three choices. Any range that includes this reference. Now, this is the broadest search that you can do. So any range that includes this reference might be anything that talks about Acts chapter 2 or anything that talks about Acts chapter 1 to chapter 5. Do you follow that? I mean, it's the broadest search for your particular verse. The next one is short ranges that include this reference. Most likely it's going to be Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 2 verses 20 to 40. You follow? It's going to be a smaller pericope. It's going to do its best not to include hits that are going to be Acts chapter 1 through 15. All right? And then the last one is this reference exactly. I want you to click on this reference exactly and say search. You should have two hits. The first one is chapter uh, 12 of the early church fathers. Click on it and it's going to go ahead and open to volume one of the early church fathers and you'll notice that right there what is the quote? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remissions of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You think that quote is talking about Acts 2.38? I think so. So you just found a place in the early church fathers, most specifically in the anti-Nicene fathers, where they're talking about your verse. Okay? Now, where are we in the anti-Nicene fathers? And this is, this is the part of how they've done this that drives me nuts. Whose writing are we looking at? Toggle your locator pane. Your locator pane at the top, you have your contents pane and your locator pane. The two little icons in the upper right hand corner of that window. The locator pane shows you exactly where you are in the Anti-Nicene Fathers. You're in Irenaeus against heresies Book 3, Chapter 12. Do you see that? Does everybody see that? Your locator pane at the top of the window. Look at my screen. Right up here in the top of this window, you want to click. You've got toggle contents pane or toggle locator pane. Locator pane. Brett, you hit your arm up? Hand up? Yeah. Um, Both arm and hand, I guess, technically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, if I was going to make reference to this, though, I mean, still, I, you know, I have chapter 12 here, but I'm not going to be able to get an exact reference. Yeah, this is, this is one of those areas where I don't think they do a very good job. Um, now, if I copy and paste this, um, and we haven't gotten there yet, but if I copy and paste this, it's going to give me a reference, but it's not going to tell me Irenaeus against heresies. So I need this information, and I would, I would paste that in. The rest of the reference will be okay. Um, and you can use this early church father's numbering. The other thing that it will do um, is it will give you the page number in the print book. So I can go to volume 1, page 430 upstairs and find this exact quote if I need to cite it more accurately. Um, but how do you cite from the early church fathers is it's not very well managed in my opinion um, and so now most people just want a footnote and so it'll do that just fine but if you're going to cite full MLA you've got some work to do as far as finding this exact citation but at least now with the locator pane you can see where you are I mean, when it first opens, it just says Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, and you're at your quote. I mean, you've got, in my mind, you know, I'm searching nine volumes. All I know is that I'm in somewhere in Volume 1. If you toggle your contents pane, it'll show you a little bit more accurately where you are. 
at least as far as the scope of the entire book. So, um, what doesn't help? I mean, there's, it's just like that one. It's just like the... Right, but it shows you more in context of the entire book. You know, you're halfway through. But it's basically the same information in just a different format. But do you see how now we can search the anti-Nicene Fathers? I didn't search every book and have to filter through all that. I had another reference, too, uh, and I can click on it, and it'll open another reference in Volume 5 to that same uh, reference. They're talking about Acts 2.38 here. So just that quickly, I have found... Two sources in the early church fathers, in the anti-Nicene fathers specifically, that are talking about my passage. That might come in very handy, don't you think? We're now starting to do extra biblical searches, and that that is helpful. But I didn't, I wasn't just relegated to searching all unlocked resources. Well, I was I was just uh, trying to create the hyperlink in Microsoft. And for this, you know, for the Andy Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, and all that stuff. And uh, I try to do it whenever I click it in Word. Uh, after the Andy Nicene Fathers, Volume 1 is closed, it just takes you to the title page. Um, switch to page number as your active reference. Uh, excuse me, as, as your active index, and try to do it again, and it may work then. Um, but it... It should work. Do you understand what's happening here with, with these references? Now, go ahead and close those two windows if you open those two anti-Nicene Father windows and change your match to short ranges that include this reference and search again. Yeah, it didn't really change it. All I got was the same two hits. Let's try any range that includes these two. See, I just got those same two hits. Typically, what will happen is as you change that match range, you'll get more and more hits. So it's a way of focusing down to your particular uh, path. We'll go ahead and stop there for now. And uh, we'll pick this up in just a little bit. Yeah, just a second. Let me get the... Just one second. Okay. Just a second. Yeah. Come on. He's right there. Huh. 